taking it. And you know what? Andrew, wasn't it? Andrew. Andrew, yeah, I said, it's all the rest of it's on there. Prayer meeting this Sunday. And also Tuesday Bible study, the reading there. John will be taking us to your pages of Hebrews. Coffee morning Wednesday. Communion Thursday. We would love, if you are coming to communion, we would love just to know because then we can lay out for as many people that are coming. Okay? And uh, next Sunday is prayer meeting. Start services next week. There's a list on the back of those for needing our prayers. Russell is away this weekend taking a devotion at camp in Charmouth. Um, so we'll just pray for him, the challenges he faces. And it looks like Carrie's going back in Indonesia. That's good news. And um, pray for Jackie, uh, Anna, Matthew, and Michael, their funeral. Uh, uh, there is on Friday at 2.30 at Trinity Church. And um, Andrew's dad, John, his home, it's all there on the bit for prayers and praise. So let's just come to God in prayer. God and Father, we thank you for this day, a new day. We thank you that your mercy is in you every morning. And we can say, great is your faithfulness. And we worship you this morning. We pray, Lord, and we saw the chaos, confusion of our world, that you would give us that sense of your presence and your peace. So pour your spirit upon your people today, wherever they meet. And uh, Lord, let's say, worship you this morning, accept their praise. As we read your word, as we listen to your word, as we hear your word, Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn is in your hymn book there, and it's uh, number 54.
Rain to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they will speak with their enemies in the gate. What keeps you awake at night? And as we reflected on that psalm, it said, it's a waste of time struggling to go to sleep. Resting in the Lord is so important. It's vain to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrow, for so he gives his beloved sleep. I do love David when he said these words, I will both lie myself down and I will sleep. Sometimes it's difficult, isn't it? There's so much going on. And Carol said, I didn't have a good night last night. I said, what was the problem? She said, I don't know. She said, but I just couldn't go to sleep. But let's just thank God for sleep this morning, for rest, for peace, in a world of turmoil. Let's pray. Our loving God and Father, once again we come into your presence, we seek your face, we thank you for that beautiful hymn we have sung, uh, Lord, and the Lord is King. We worship you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we thank you that through what Christ has done on the cross, he now reigns triumphant in glory. He has paid the price for our sin, he has defeated death, and all power is his on heaven and on earth. Lord, as we worship you this morning, Lord, we, we come with all the things that crowd into our past week, and perhaps the fears and the, the, the frights of what is to face us tomorrow. But Lord, we love that again, that as we face tomorrow, with its problems large and small, we trust the God of miracles and the Lord of our Lord, you're still the same, Lord, yesterday, today, and forever. And the great privilege is ours to worship you on this Sunday morning. Be with those who are away preaching, we think of Russell, we think of John, we think of Andrew. We pray they'll be all they need today or whatever you're talking to do. And we pray wherever your people need today. They may be in the open air, they may be large congregations, they may be just struggling with half a dozen people. But Lord, it's an honour, Lord, to know that we can worship you, the living God. And your praise will never die over. Lord, we pray for our world with all its hate and all its needs, Lord. And Lord, it's just so tragic to see the world as it is. We think of your judgment against our world in so many ways. We think of the floods in Pakistan, and we pray for those who seem to have lost everything they had in this world. Lord, have mercy upon them. We think of the Ukraine, Lord, it's war torn, and Lord, we thank you for the aid that is still getting out, and also for the church in Ukraine, which is so strong. Lord, we just thank you for that. Thank you too, Lord. Lord. Your presence, Lord, in so many areas of our world where we just didn't even pray. Lord, we thank you that Carrie has got back safely to Indonesia in the middle of the monsoon season. Lord, and we do pray for her and those Bibles which she has translated as they go out as a team of done into the hands of the local Nalatahan people. We pray for our country, our land. We think of the unrest in our country. There's strikes, Lord. There's, uh, there's, there's um, people struggling, Lord, to face the future, Lord, and everybody is clamouring for some kind of answers. Lord, we realise the answers are really found within your word. We thank you for those who wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Lord, help us to trust you this morning. And for ourselves, Lord, in living love, remake us, Lord. Make us what you want us to be. And if any here this morning do not no one it is to put their trust, their faith, their hope in this living God. Lord, just touch that heart this morning. And help us, Lord, to serve you as we should and to love you as we want. Lord, we pray for those who are sorrowing and grieving this week, and we think especially Jackie and the family. We lift them up before you. Thank you for your life and here. Thank you is with you in glory. We do not sorrow as those who have hope. And we pray your arms of comfort and love will embrace that family. Pray to those who are worried, anxious about their health, to know that you are the great, the great physician, one not necessarily able to heal our bodies, but the one that gives us that inner peace and that perfect answer to all our sins and all our problems. Lord, we think of that lovely hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God. And so we lift these prayers before you this morning. Your blessing upon this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, where are we going this morning? Where are we going this morning? Um, where are you, Cornelia? Oh, Cornelia. Oh, right, you're up. Right. 
some bigger pictures about Lego. Look at that. That's all made out of Lego bricks. Right? Now let me tell you what that is then. Lego land, that's right. Oh, yeah, Lego land. It's a Lego land, isn't it? That's right. And what about this one then? Princess Dolly. No, no, Princess Dolly. No, it's Kate. Kate, yeah. Kate William, that's the one, yeah. Kate William, yeah. And what are those then? They're transformers, aren't they? So they can change from one thing to another. I want to tell you about a story about a boy this morning, right? Who was changed. There he is, Manny. Got him? So Lego. Really. Story comes from the Bible, actually. And uh, he was born into quite a rich family because his dad was a king. Right? And dad was quite old when he was born because. Uh, his name was Hezekiah, he was, he was a really good king, he loved God, and he taught people how to worship God. But Manny didn't do things like that. And though he grew up as a, as a prince, and one day he king, and of course one day, Dad died. He was very sad when Dad died, because, you know, he was never king. But he wasn't a good king. He began to do things that were wrong. And he wouldn't listen when people told him he was wrong. And so he grew up through life, he did a lot of cruel things, he killed people, and he didn't love God, and he turned the other way from God, and he turned to idols, I did a lot of terrible things. And in the end, do you know where he ended up? That's in Rose the King here. That's it. There he is. He ended up in prison. Well, you know, I meet, I meet a lot of men in prison, don't I? But he was in prison and he was so, so angry and so upset because he was in prison. But do you know what he did for the first time in his life? He prayed to God. And he asked God to forgive him. And he asked God to, 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 to help him in this mess. And not just somebody here this morning struggling just like that and feeling, oh, I just can't find my way out of this prison. Well, he came back. He got the throne back. Then the king again, he tried to do good things. But I want to notice what he says in all those words. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. Let God transform you into a new person. And that at the bottom is a transformer. And then you turn a car into a thing like that, you can turn it back again. And when you become a Christian, your life is changed, it's transformed. You no longer love the bad things you used to do. Because he listened to his friends, he did all the things he thought he could do, he was doing bad things. And God forgave him. And that's what's so wonderful, isn't it? Because God is prepared to forgive us all our bad and to give us a new life in Jesus. So there's my story up in Manasseh, I call him Manny. There he is. Right, okay. And that's where we should point in a minute, but we're going to do something else first, aren't we? Between? Yeah. Right, come on. Well, you've got another song for us, haven't you? So we're um, put out the words for this one, but it's the wise man built his house upon the rock. Um, so basically you repeat that three times. The wise man built his house upon the rock, the wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rain came tumbling down. And then the chorus is, the rain came down, and the floods came up. The rain came down, the floods came up. And then the house on the rock stood firm. And then the foolish man built his house upon the sand, repeat that three times, and the rain came tumbling down. And at the end of that one, the rain goes flat. And then it's, so build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Sorry, I thought it was on the, um, the the Wednesday Club PowerPoint, um, but it wasn't. But let's just play it through first time and then we'll join it. So Dad, you'll sing really loud because you're doing the words, okay? <laughs>
Corinthian Street area. Oh, thank you, Jim. Um, not with Rachel, that's okay. I'm there now. Got four nurses in the house, church, you'll be all right. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as to you, your babes in Christ. You're still a baby. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able to, because you still carnal. Do you know you have envy and strife and divisions among you? Are you not carnal and behaving like other men? When one of you says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Paulus, and are you not being carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? They're ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labour. We are God's fellow workers, we are God's field, we are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another will build on it. But let each one take heed how you build. For no other foundation can be anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone built on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay and straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so with fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anybody who defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in his age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it's written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul, Apollos, or Peter, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God. God oh, bless the reading of his word, and uh, we're going to sing now on the book again, well, on the book again, right? Number 822, 822. Jesus calls us all the tools of our lights while blessed the sea. Day by day is sweet voice sounding, saying, Christian, follow me. Eight two two, we start to sing. Oh. 
to verse 9 on Paul's letter. Corinthians chapter 3. Your God's fellow workers, your God's built, you are God's building. Let's pray. Our loving God, before you we have for us, we have your word, infallible, inspired word of God. You know the needs of each one here this morning, from the one that's closest to you, to the one that's farthest from you. And Lord, whether this goes out line later on, or this morning here, Lord, we just pray you'll meet our need. Bless us, we pray. Help us to understand, not only in our mind, but to believe in our heart, and to proclaim with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord. In Jesus' name we ask it. site in our country. Well, we're proud to say it's in Somerset, say it's in Somerset, in this Hinkley Point power station. And I think that's a big gar for somebody that crane in the middle. 2,000 people work on that site. So why are they building on that site? What are they building for? You prepare? You see, there is a plan, there is a purpose in this construction of this massive site. I don't think we're going to get the electricity that much cheaper, but never mind. And this morning, I want to take you down three lines. Look at these. What are you building on? What are you building with? What are you building for? And these are our thoughts which we're going to consider this morning. So, you are God's building. That's you, that's me. So let's have a look and see what Paul is saying to us in chapter 3. We've been going through this uh, letter of um, Paul to the Corinthians. And as we think of this church of Corinthian, it's amazing the way the church was first formulated and started. It started way back in Acts chapter 18. Paul went to Corinth and he got a pretty rough deal. And uh, he ends up with two friends joining, Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers and Paul ends up in business together, if you like. So they were core members of this church. Uh, and then there was Justice, uh, the man from next door to the church. Then it was the church leader. Gallio was the leader and the, the governor of the day. And when the Jews tried to get Paul stopped from preaching the gospel, Gallio just chucked them out of the courthouse and gave them a good thrash in. And let Paul stay there. God said, for 18 months you're going to stay here and build my church. And so the church became the church of Jesus Christ in Corinth. And started in all sorts of dead ways. And there were all sorts of people in that church. We know the names of about eight of them, founder members of this church. We also know in chapter 6, if you just turn to chapter 6 for just a few moments, this lovely thought then that um, such were some of you, but you were sanctified, you were washed, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. People were coming to faith in Christ. And if you read the verse before in chapter 6 there, you will receive these words, do you not know the unrighteous? Will not inherit the kingdom of God, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revelers, extortioners, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God, but such were some of you. And people were coming to faith from all sorts of backgrounds. And they were believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, What a lovely church, I would love to belong to that church. But the church has some mega problems. And the problems basically worked around this. They really thought that they had the best ideas, not God. And so earlier on in this chapter 3, which we've got before us this morning, uh, we find those words there that some of them were saying, I'm a follower of Paul. I follow Apollos, who was a great teacher. Uh, and some even followed Peter. But better than that, some followed Jesus. And the church was divided. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. At a church not too many miles from here, they've got a new pastor. And you know, there is division in the church. And the church is splitting. And it is so sad to see this lovely church, which for years has been going on, has got these divisions. And you know, even within this church, we could get upset over the songs we sing, over the, the arrangement of the chairs, of the way the services is run. All sorts of things could divide the church. But my friends, we must pray for the unity of the church. 
But Paul says this is your number one problem in this church here. You, you're divided. You see, my friends, this morning, if you're a believer this morning, you are one in Christ Jesus. And we should pray for the unity of the church. You know, you don't make unity, you maintain unity. You keep unity going. There is the unity of the church. And Paul says, I've got to deal with this. He uses a word like carnal. He's really saying you're just being a humanist. You're basically looking at things from a human perspective all the time. And he says in verse 5, then, who is Paul? Who is Paul? We're only ministers through whom you believe as the Lord gave to each one of us. I planted, the Paul's did the watering for me, and God made it grow. And I think this is a major problem in our church today, that we can think that we do everything. No, we're just used by God to sow a seed. And then somebody prays about it. You know, what is your prayer life like? What is my prayer life like? There's people here this morning that have got issues and problems in their lives. It's our responsibility to pray for one another. And so fulfill the law of Christ. And we found here this morning this church was, was, was splitting all over the place. Paul says, brothers, I love you. But brothers, you're wrong. And Paul has to try and drive this church in the right direction. You see, the interesting thing is that they learned here that love is the centre of the universe. And it wasn't until Paul got down to chapter 13 when he begins to teach them what love is really like. There's no greater thing than love. Then, of course, they were struggling with the resurrection. So you've got chapter 15 coming on behind that, which talks about the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of your body and my body. And if Christ isn't raised from the dead, then our faith is just a waste of time. We're doing tinkling brass and sounding cymbals or something like that. So let's have a look this morning at what Paul's got to say here. The major issue that Paul is dealing with, of course, here is the... Uh, division in the church, and he has to try and make sure that this church is united together. And a reminder in chapter 9, three, verse 9. Firstly, look at yourself in the spiritual mirror. Ask your, analyze yourself. What does God think about you? We're thinking about that earlier this morning. And firstly, what are you building on? Your life? What are you building with? And what are you building for? You see, Carol's parents um, lived at Dickland. He worked for British Railways all his life. And um, just after the war, they began to build some new houses in Dickland. Lovely red brick houses right near the station. So his father all fine. He could walk to work, wave his guards, laugh about all night long. He was happy. It was their first home. It was a lovely home. You know, there were hundreds of those homes there. And it wasn't until 1976 that something went wrong. In 1976, we had the same sort of summer as we've got this year. And I've noticed cracks in my garage up here because the ground is so dry and shrunk. And they built all those houses on clay because that's the way we've always built houses on clay in southern England. And it wasn't in 1976 that these houses began to split because they didn't have a good foundation. My friends, what is your life being built on as a Christian? And Paul says here there is only one foundation that can be laid and is laid. This is why we saw that old song this morning, Build Your Life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're going to be thinking this morning of those three things as we come to this. So the first thing I want to think about this morning then on there is what are you building on? And we notice there in verse 11 these words, there is no other foundation that anyone can lay than which is laid. You see, your life and my life as a Christian is being built on something. Everybody's life, they're putting things into their lives which they think is going to help them and make them proper and prosper and everything else. But Paul reminds us who we are in verse 9. Now I want you to sort out verse 9 and say that. We are God fellow workers. That is the ministers, the teachers, the preachers. That's we, says Paul. But who are you? And he goes on in verse 9 to say who you are. You are God's field. Now the field is really the world. Listen to the story of the, of the Good Samaritan, uh, sorry, of the, of, the, of the sower of the seed. And he said, the world is the field. And the seed that is sown is the word of God. And so he said, there's three things here. Firstly, 
we, the church's leaders, the ones who teach, the ones who preach, they're the ones who are the first bit in that person line there. God's fellow workers. You are God's field. That's the world. And then finally, personally, you are God's building. That's what you put on the field. You put a building. Well, in fact, when we're developing Saxon Vale, which is a, a rubbish in town site, it took us about 30 years in front to get around to think about it. We're going to put something on it at last. But, uh, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ is a global church. And it's being built with people like you and me. Paul goes on to talk about us being living stones, being shaped and molded into this body of Christ. But your life and mine is a very personal thing. We're fellow workers, we're ministers together, and also you are God's field, the gospel, seed bed, the global church. And you personally are God's building. Check out chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. It says there, Who is a us? ministers for whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted Paul's water, but it's God that gives the increase. So this morning, can I ask you a question? What is your faith based, based upon? What are you building your life upon? Is it on your good works, your efforts, right? Great things that they are. Your compassion, your love, wonderful. But if your life is not built on Christ, you're building on shaking he is the solid rock, which I'll sing in a minute, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. So this morning, can I ask you that question again? Have you really come to Christ? Have you confessed your sins? Are you living for him? Is your life got a new direction? And when the storms of life come, and when the shift, shifting sands of time seem to shape your, your life, you have that solid foundation. read Psalm 46 and say, even though the earth is taken, shaken and taken away, we have that great refuge. Our refuge is God. And that under, underneath are those everlasting arms. So that's the building we'll be thinking about this morning. The wrong part of this building. You're building your life, I'm building my life. We briefly looked at the young bit earlier this morning about uh, Manasseh who built his life on what he thought was best and he was a big disaster led so many people into sin and destruction. God had mercy upon him and changed his life and turned him around. Secondly, this morning, what are you building with? Look at verse 12. There's an interesting selection of things that Paul weighs into here. If anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay and straw. You see, notice that this is being built on that foundation. So, what Paul is referring to here in verse 12 is believers, it's Christians, right? Because it says if anybody builds on that foundation, <coughs> but what do you put onto it? And you'll notice that with those things there, some of them are worth having, and other stuff isn't much good at all. It starts off by talking at the very top, and it reminds us there that there's gold, and there's silver, and there's precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. Some of the stuff is durable, some of the stuff isn't durable. But it's amazing what you and I put into our lives. But as Christians, what are you really seeking to put into your life? You know, Paul has this long list there in, in, in the book of Galatians, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, all those things. But notice too that those things are going to be tested. The things that you trust in, what you depend upon, Philip was in prison 10, 15 years ago. He's a tough guy. He got in prison because um, he'd basically done the government out of about 250,000 pounds. He'd done some dodgy deals. And he'd got this beautiful bungalow up on the Cotswolds. And uh, they took a bungalow off of him and put him in prison. It was worth half a million pounds, but they only wanted 250,000. So somebody got a snip that day, didn't they? And he was so angry. And he was going to get everybody back for what they'd done to him. But in that prison at the same time, there was a man called T, chapter in the West Indies. And he just stuck with him. And he shared the gospel with him. And one day, Philip came to faith in Christ. And I remember being there at the end of his sentence when he went, went out. And he looked at me and he smiled. He said, Jim, he said, it doesn't matter. I've got Jesus. 
family was still together. He went back to rebuild his life. But he realized that some of the things he built his life upon were very shaky. What are you building your life upon? Because we notice there that, that we do put things into our lives. And some of the things we would count in this world's values as being valuable and precious and precious stones. And uh, then there's the wood, the hay and the straw. But we notice too that in life, what are you building for? And if we come to verse 13, we notice that it's going to be sorted out one day what your life is all about. Is it solely built on Christ? I love it when Nigel comes into church in the morning and he says, Jim, I've had such a wonderful time with the Word of God this week. And I think, oh, this is beautiful. And he's been sharing some of the blessings that God's done as he's read his Word. As God has spoken to him, and this is what we should be rejoicing in. The things the Word can't take from us. They can take everything from us. Uh, Job is a classic example in the Old Testament. You know, he's a wealthy man, he had a lovely big family, and the devil was allowed to take everything away from him except his faith. And he just hangs on in there. And he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. But one day, when I'm dust and ashes, and the worms have eaten my body, I shall see him for myself. I know. I know. Do you know in whom you have believed? Are you confident he's able to keep what you've committed to him against that day? Because that's what faith is all about. It's building on the Lord Jesus Christ. But we notice here that what are you building for? Time or for eternity? Listen to what's going to happen. Verses, and we run down to verse 16 there. Each one's work will become clear. The evidence is going to be there eventually. What is valuable in your lives? People will begin to notice, but there's going to be a day coming when God's going to judge what's in your lives and in my lives. But it's going to be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work. It doesn't mean that their house is going to be going to burn down. That's not the sort of fire. This is God's testing fire. He gives the principle in Scripture of the way that gold is refined and silver is refined. And you get this lump of stuff from the ground and you smash it up and you put it in a, a crucible, a vessel. And you light the fire under it. And it's so hot that it actually melts everything else. And, and the bits of other stuff float to the surface and they just spoon it off the top. And eventually, well, there's no bits of muck on the top. And he sees his perfect reflection in that gold. He knows it's pure gold then. And God will test your life and my life of the things that we put into it. But we notice that some of these things can be destroyed with fire and some cannot. Go back to that list in verse 12 again. And we notice the gold, silver, and precious stones are almost indestructible. But anything in this world. But the wood, hay, and straw, that's gone in no time. The fire that came out just around the corner from here a few weeks ago, we started with a small spark in the front garden, and very soon it burnt the neighbor's fence down. Then his motorbike, then his car, then his speedboat, then the front of the house all melted. The plastic windows. It was so quick and so frightening. And you know, your life and mine are going to be tested. And ask the question here, so what is going to survive this sort of thing? And you know, you can think of some of the things of like righteousness and holiness that can never be destroyed. And your faith in Christ, if it's built solely on that, it, it will survive anything. Because he's promised to keep us and to present us faultless before the Father's throne. But sometimes there are things that have to be dealt with in our lives. Go back to the story in John's Gospel of the vine tree and the gardener comes along and he starts lopping a few branches off and, you, you know, he's not just sort of doing a bit of fun. He, he's taking off the branches that don't produce any fruit. And what I learned a few years ago, I got to do that, my plum tree was all set in these straight ones up, it looked lovely and green, but no fruit. I had to cut them off to get some plums this year. And God does the same with your life. You really. don't like it, it hurts a bit when takes things away from us that we love. But you know, the trouble is with things, they're sticky. They seem to cling to us. We think we're free from them, but we'd be surprised. What would be the first thing you would grab if your head was on fire? What would you want to take with you? You know, would you go around with a shopping trolley, put all your stuff in it, you could get in? Because this is what happens. Things cling to us. But God is
is that great God? And he, he reminded us here that, that um, if anybody's word, which is built on, endures, he will receive the reward. And that's a wonderful thought, a promise, isn't it? Paul could say at the end of his life, I have fought the fight, I've run the race, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. And he said, I want this Corinthian church to understand this. There's a lot of things that you're being put into your life. You're living sectarianism, division. You're taking one another to court. You're suing each other because you don't like that person. You want to get evil with them. He said, you've got to get back to find out what that is all about. And that's what Paul struggles with right through this letter. To make sure they understand what love is like. And he wrote chapter 13. Notice too, as we go through this, do you not know that your, the your body is the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Does that make any difference to the way you respond to situations, things in your life? You know, so often we, we, we end up seeing something on the news and we think like the world thinks. And we say, well, I deserve it, just a job, yeah, uh, we can get very judgmental on people. But we need to go back to that's the question that Beth did to me many years ago. She came over with this little rubber thing on her wrist with WWJD on it. And I said, what's that for? And she said, well, I wear that because when things go wrong in my life, I look at it. And he said, what would Jesus do? And if Jesus was there present in your life in these times of testings like this, times of knee-jerk reactions, how would you respond? Would you love? Would you continue to hate? Because this is the things that endure, the things that we've done. I was talking to Thomas when he came in this morning about Matthew chapter 25, where he says those words, I was naked and you clothed me, I was hungry and you fed me, I was in prison and you visited me. Uh, he said, well, I didn't notice you, Jesus, I didn't see you. And he said, no, but you did it for me, I noticed it. And these are the things, the fruits of the Spirit which should come from our lives, the love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, the gentleness, the self-control. Maybe that's the one at the end of the line that you find challenging this morning. Self-control. You fly off the handle still. You, you express your opinion. Remember, opinion is something you hold, but a conviction is something that holds you. And that's entirely different. And we notice here that, that what are you building for? And if anybody defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. Anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, smart, clever, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Think it through seriously, perhaps this morning. Where is your life going? What have you put into your life? What are you building for? Time or for eternity? It's an important question, isn't it? And Paul notes, says these words in verse 19, and this is great. The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. We looked at that last week. Where it's written, he catches the wise in their own smartness or craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They're absolutely futile. Why can't our government sort these problems out? I'll tell you why. Because they're using human reason and human wisdom. Not one of them has actually seen the God and God say, Lord, what can we do? We're all going to sort it out ourselves. We're going to sort the world out, the environment. We're going to sort everything out. No, we're not. Because God is judging our world. The only offer of salvation and hope is through Christ Jesus. His love and his mercy and his forgiveness and his wisdom. Last week, if you remember, we looked upon the chapter before that, the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is not the wisdom of the age. If it had been, then they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of life and glory. Because that was the way they thought was the answer to the world's problems. Get rid of God out of our lives. But friends, I'm thankful that Christ not only went to that cross, but defeated death. If you and me this morning an opportunity to take up the cross and follow him and to live for Jesus. Yeah, let's come down towards the end of this chapter we got in this morning. And uh, Paul says these words in verse 21 to 23. And these are the words I want to sort of come to an end. This is Paul's vision. This is Paul's passion. And I can hear Paul almost sweating as he writes these words. There. He is so important. I want you to get this message. Let no one boast in man. Vain is the help of man. Because everything is yours. Oh, come on. What does that mean? Well, the prosperity gospel says if you become a Christian, you'll have this, you'll have everything 
everything in this world. No, we don't have everything in this world. Jesus said, you know, be of good cheer and overcome the world. In the world you will have tribulation. But then keep your chin up. Keep going forward. And you see, the blessing from this, what Christ gives us, is not necessary, the resources of this world. Some of the greatest Christians are some of the poorest. When I think of Christians in Pakistan this morning, I think of Christians in North Korea, I think of Christians in many Islamic countries, just being nightly, they're coming and they're just mowing the Christians down and killing them. They're rich because they have this hope which the world cannot take away from. And they, they've gone, the martyr's death, you read Revelation, and you find this, a lot of people standing very close to the throne in their white robes. And John says, well, who are these? And he says these words, these are those who've come out of the great tribulation. They've given, they've given their life for me. And they're standing around the throne. They never lose their reward. And that will be you, brother or sister, this morning. So Paul is saying here, that no one boasts in this because everything is yours. But whether it's Paul or Paul or Stephen, that's Peter, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, look, get it into your perspective. Listen up, and that's it. All are yours. You're not promised you're going to be rich. You're not promised you're going to be healthy. You're not promised you're going to be wealthy. But brothers, is there anything that can replace this morning what means to be? To know you have enough for the God of all creation. To know that Christ has paid to sin and he intercedes with us now in heaven. You know, you know, and he, he interprets your prayers and he, he listens to you. We're only thinking this morning that God thinks about us all the time. Do we think about him? Then he says these lovely words. And you are Christ. And Christ is God. Let me ask you a question. Do you want anything more than that this morning? Because that's what we should be hungry for, to be known as Christ. A Christian is a proud owner of everything that can't be bought with money. I'll say that again. A Christian is a proud owner of everything that can't be bought with money. Remember this, money is the provider of everything but happiness, the passport Brothers and sisters, this morning, what are you building up? What are you building with? What are you building for? Time or eternity? As we bow Lord in quiet reflection now, to examine our own lives, our own hearts, the direction of our lives. ask you to help us to focus on what it means to take up our cross and follow you. We have to deny ourselves, Lord, so many things. Lord, the world is a beautiful place and it seems to offer so much, but it did to Eve. Never did her any good. And suddenly sin, that, that great thing which can so easily entrap even the strongest of Christians. <coughs> and we can fall for its offers. It seems so great, wonderful deal. But to him our saints, to know Christ passes all understanding. And to know his peace in our hearts. May that be our prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our last hymn is going to be on the place of solid rock and bill, sand, and other things. Go on, 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 go yeah, I'm in control of the rock. But hope is built on nothing else than Jesus Christ and righteousness.
hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes.